Blog Talk Radio. Hello, this is Carol Francis from Make Life Happen. I'm going to be talking with Nick Prukoff. Hello, Nick. How are you? I'm fine, Carol. It's good to hear your voice. You are a fitness trainer. It's been around for at least 22 years, and now you are in a whole other aspect of the industry. Would you like to describe who you are and what you do? Yes, Carol, I'd be happy to. Um, I have experienced fitness from a lot of angles, but now I'm in the process of looking at healthy aging because I myself have been um, experiencing what it's like to become older. And in celebration of my 60th birthday a couple of years ago, I wrote my first book on healthy aging. And now, I'm in, and now I'm interested in, in sharing some of that knowledge and being able to help people get into their 40s, 50s, and 60s and beyond and be able to live the lives they always dreamed of, purposeful, focused, happy, healthy, and fit. Okay, so now let's pretend that there's someone listening that's 45 years old and just starting to become conscious of needing to become fit. They're about 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight, and they're listening to this. So what do you do? How do you start? You basically have to take a look at what your motives are, because it's always in setting the motives and becoming passionate about something that's going to get you down down that road. And what I was thinking uh, first might be most helpful is to look at your behaviors and look at what is most unsettling to you. And once you start examining what you've done, you can start taking a look at what you might want to change. And so those changes are the most important things to make. And again, again, when you're 45, you don't want to make all the changes at once. You want to start with baby steps. So for example, you might want to examine your activity schedule and how much activity you have on your schedule. And maybe you might want to add a walk, or maybe you might want to add drinking water, or maybe you might want to add taking time out to be with yourself and calm down and, and deal with the stresses of your life. So there's a number of steps you can take that will, that will expand your consciousness and start you on the road to becoming passionate about that goal for becoming fit. Now, if you had an individual that was, let's say, now in their 50, they're 55, they've done a little bit of fitness, but they've definitely become occupied with the everyday chores of just existing and paying bills, and they come to you, uh, and they're 55. What do you do that's different now for someone who's 55 that 45-year-olds that were? It, it's just a different program. What, would you, what do you do that's different? Well, I think in, at 55 you have to examine the um, issue from the medical standpoint because by the time you start getting into your, your later years, you may be on medication, you may have had some injuries, you may have had problems with your back or your knees, it's always wise at that point to really take a hard look at the medical side before you begin a program. So the first step would be to get a complete evaluation from a medical um, uh, specialist, somebody that could take a look at you and make sure that you're going to be safe when you start training. Um, and I think that's the first and most important step, to find out what limitations you might have and to take a real hard look at what, what you might want to do to be safe when you start your okay. new program. It sounds so, really yeah, filled with caution. Yeah, I would say it, it's, it's, it's a red flag, especially when you've had other issues come up. So I like to look at the psychological aspects of, of a person at their 55th birthday. Uh, I like to look at their physical condition, uh, their spine, for example, their posture, their balance, uh, their strength, their capacity to do uh, what they say they want to do. Um, and then when you're designing a program for someone who's 55 and older, you're really trying to look at ways to keep them safe and happy at the same time. You want to be engaged in the activity safely. So I would say safety is number one. And then how about when you approach 60, 65? At that point, you really want to have um, more of a social atmosphere. I've seen my seniors uh, want to be engaged with others. And so maybe something along the lines of partnering with someone, a friend, uh, might make sense because when you're in your, your 60s and you're approaching those years where you haven't had an opportunity to be as engaged in a fitness lifestyle, it's really good to get support from family or friends. Um, and what I've noticed in the, senior co- in the senior community particularly is that they enjoy the activity because they can share it with others. Uh, so group activities make sense. And we have had classes in the past where seniors showed up and uh, engaged in the activity, and then had a chance to stand around or be around with each other and share uh, their experiences with each other, have fun. Uh, but making it fun, I think, is the most important thing so that they'll continue to come. And, um, and when you share it with a friend, it makes it a lot more, it makes it a lot more meaningful. 
That makes a ton of sense. You know that laughter is one of the best things psychologically for mental health, and I would think that fun and laughter along with exercise just peps up the whole spirit, changes the biochemistry of an individual. Absolutely. I find, absolutely. I think having fun uh, is, is an essential key to being fit and, and having a healthy lifestyle. People are not going to continue to do something when they're not engaged and having fun. I'm asked very often in my, in my work as a trainer, uh, what is the best exercise? And I'll say it's the one that you enjoy the most. It's the one that you'll right. do. It's the one that you're going to engage in and you're going to have fun with. If you can't have fun with it, then you're probably not going to continue to do it, and you'll just get stuck, and you'll get angry and frustrated, and that's not a good place to begin. And just burn out all interest and enthusiasm. Okay, Absolutely. so now you, you have written a book. You are so energetic whenever you speak about this book. Talk to us about this book. Well, the book was designed as a roadmap. I, I found when I sat down to write the book back in 2006, I was really interested in sharing with myself what I'd learned over the course of, of my years of living and what it was that would make me get up in the morning and, and try to have the best possible later years of my life. Wow. Uh, so the book, the book is essentially a roadmap which questions, which questions me on how well I'm doing, and it starts with vision, and it goes from vision all the way through to uh, establishing a plan. And I think one of the things I noticed over the years when I was training seniors particularly is that they've given up the, the right to be happy and engaged in living. And what they were doing was essentially going to doctors and taking their medications and, and retiring or wanting to travel, but they didn't have purpose. And I think that one of the key things I learned in writing the book was that having purpose will allow me to have those years be meaningful and powerful, and that's what I want for people to have, meaningful and powerful years. That's what I want. Yes. Now, it has a lot of chapters in it, you say, and those chapters, 35, is that correct? Uh-huh. And yeah. you were surprised. You were surprised that you had that many chapters inside you. That's what I remember when we first talked. Yes, I was surprised that I was able to write as much as I was about the process. I asked a lot of questions in the book because what I wanted to do was establish a framework for my growth in the future. I could have written the book probably to celebrate my 40th or 50th birthday, but I wasn't ready to do it. And mm -hmm. what I wanted to cover was uh, as broad a range of issues as I could. And what I found was that only one of the five parts dealt with the actual fitness program itself, and the other parts dealt with the mind and the body, because I found that the healthiest people have a connection between their mind, their body, and their spirits, and they are conscious. And conscious people tend to be happy people, and happy people tend to be active people, and active and healthy people tend to be happy. And happiness to me is the key to a happy uh, and, and productive future. I don't think people realize that we don't become happier as we get older, we become more afraid as we get older. And I think that's something I want to deal with in the book. That's beautiful. Okay, so now let's say an individual comes to you. They, they have been afraid. They're afraid to fall. They're afraid to injure themselves. They're, they're afraid to get out. And, and uh, why, how do you talk to them? How do you, I mean, I'm a psychologist, but you're a fitness trainer. You're dealing with the very psychology of embracing life when they're facing fears that everybody's told them, you know, you need to be afraid. You're older. You're more fragile. I like to talk to that? people. I like, yeah, I like to talk to people about that up front. What I do is I, I engage them on their motivations and their reasons for coming to me. And what I've found is that in the dialogue, we start to de de decrease the intensity of those fears by having a conversation on what's becoming possible in their lives rather than what's become impossible. And I have found, no matter whether people are on medication or have had spinal injuries or knee injuries or, or other problems that have literally taken them away from being the person they wanted to be, I have had in the dialogue an opportunity to diffuse those fears and give them reasons to hope. And I think the reason to hope is the key, is the key message I try to impart to people. No matter where you are, no matter what age you are, no matter what your condition there is, way, there is a reason to be hopeful. And I have seen people who are grossly obese just get in the pool and start walking in the pool. And all wow. of a sudden you can see a smile come across their face. Or I've wow. seen a person come into the gym and just sit down with me, take me by the hand, and I'll lead them to a place where they can start. And that yep. starting point is for them specifically. And once you find that starting point for yourself, all of a sudden things become possible and you're no longer afraid. 
And now you're willing to take a chance. You're willing to take a chance, and you're willing to take a, a risk, and you're willing to bet on yourself. And what I'll tell people is bet on yourself. You're the best bet you'll ever make in your life, and that's the place to start to become happy and hopeful from. Okay, so now I just injured myself last night and couldn't do the treadmill. We talked about that at the very beginning. And I think that when I work with individuals and try to get them to be fit, because I run a mind-body sculpting program that involves the psychology and fitness of their spirit and of their mind and body, and in the process of that, they will get them up with a myriad of excuses. And as soon as something in their body hurts or is injured, it's like all bets are off. And to move them beyond the awareness of that one body part that's injured into actually being active and taking the rest of their body part in their hands is just tough to move them out of that focus on the injured body. So talk Mm -hmm. to me about recovering from an injury and maintaining fitness. I did that myself. I had uh, three injuries this year from running after 45 years. And what I really discovered was that I had not taken care of my feet. And so what I did was I had plantar fasciitis come in the right foot, I had a jam toe in the left foot, and I had tendonitis develop in my left knee. And so what I did was I sat and I thought about this. I thought, what kinds of things can I do so that I can allow my legs to heal? Because running was who I am, and I realized that I could cycle. And so I started started putting on some cycling programs for myself in the gym initially because I needed to be there, excuse me, to be engaged in an activity that I knew would help me. But at the same time, I continued weight training. And here's the deal. I felt as though I was recovering from the injury as I started working my muscles, and I started the weight training program so that I could start building up the strength of my muscles and start taking the pressure off my joints. In addition to that, in addition to that, I stretched. I did some stretching, which would help my feet and my knees and my muscles to take, to take the pressure off my joints. I did some meditation and prayer work, which was very important for staying in the moment with my body. And finally, and finally, I took some days off, and I started to recognize how much I appreciated the time off because now I was taking time for myself, and I had not taken the time for myself to be really in touch with my body. And so this year, I've had to learn that nagging injuries are going to come, and how I deal with those nagging injuries will determine how well I work out in the future. So, yes, it's ultimately time to heal, and second, it's alternative forms of exercise that will be gentle and, and constructive for the body so you can recover. So those are the two main things I would say right there. Beautiful. Okay, that's very useful. Well, we're also dealing in a land of a lot of fat, a lot of fattiness, metabolisms are changing, not only mm-hmm. with age, but also with the quality of food that we eat. And interestingly, I was talking to a pharmacist and a nutritionist the other day that talked about the adrenal glands and how the adrenal glands are burnt up by the use of coffee, caffeinated products, energy drinks, and, of course, stress. And so oh. here we have adrenal glands burned up, which are fundamental base works, the foundation for metabolic health. So now I would like to talk mm-hmm. about fat, metabolic health, People okay. are trying to lose weight, but they're doing it in a way that's going to cause crisis in the future. What, what okay. is, what's your take, Nick? Well, this is the other part that's really critical. People don't realize that what we're doing to our bodies is poisoning them every day. And I've, uh-huh. and I've noticed that stress and a poor diet will poison the system. Ultimately, as we get older, you're right, the metabolic rate drops. But it drops for a variety of reasons. It goes down because of the loss of lean mass. Lean mass is literally the muscle that that is the the calorie burning machine of the body and we don't use our muscles enough in this society and then on top of that we feed it just such a poor diet that we don't get the nutrients we need to keep the body functioning well so as our hormones are changing which is something we can't really stop uh, we have to start looking at eating a healthy diet and I've heard through the grapevine that there are many foods that are available to us that we're not touching at all for example I've heard uh, that we should eat more like a bear a bear eats salmon and berries, and if we ate salmon and berries at least reasonably frequently, we would be getting antioxidant value and essential fatty acids into our system that would literally help our cardiovascular system thrive, protect our organs, and, and feed our mind the things it needs to keep functioning well. So food actually is medicine for our body. So I will say two things. Number one, we need to eat nutrient-dense 
calorie deficient food and we need eat, we need to eat from a variety of the food groups so that every day our body has the opportunity to fuel itself successfully and protect the cells so they don't die and then if they don't die they will be continuing to thrive and we'll be able to keep our muscles functioning our organs functioning our minds functioning and our lives functioning and so ultimately to me eating is the very thing of life itself uh, a proper diet is absolutely essential, absolutely essential. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, good, good fatty acids from foods like fish uh, and, and, and chicken, healthy foods like those will provide the necessary uh, uh, fuels for our body and we will be able to sustain our cells and they won't die as frequently. So between exercise and eating, I think we can keep our cells alive longer and that's really important. Okay. And so in other words, you have, to, you have to fuel those muscles with the right nutrients that keeps them growing, and then you have to move those muscles in order correct. to keep them built. But That's now, correct. There's, there's also the component of the spirit, and I just did a program <laughs> two days ago on spiritual well-being and how it affects mental health and emotional health, and the research is fascinating. Well, what's your take on that? I started my spiritual journey about 1985. I got dragged off to a church of religious science in Huntington Beach, and I never stopped going through that process. And so before I even became a fitness professional, I started realizing there was a thing called a spiritual path. And I have found that when the dark days came, and they did come, I was able to find the sources within myself to keep going because I had been given tools that helped me stay alive when I was feeling dead. And I will say this, the days of feeling dead were there, and I would, not, I would not put the spiritual journey at a lower level. I would put it at a very high level. And as I've received this opportunity to become older, I realize that that's what is most important to me, is setting my mind's course for the day. And through meditation and prayer, I've learned that I am not alone, and I feel a presence with me every day. And it is only my, it's my main job to make sure I get in touch with that presence. And I feel like as the bad times come for all of us, we need a place to go. And uh, what I've been taught, it's within us. It's not outside us. Where within us, we can find those answers. That I call it the little voice and the little voice that will talk to me to guide me. And so that dialogue is critical to my future and it's critical to my daily activity of living. Uh, I think the spiritual journey is absolutely most important, and I would say that whatever path people want to get on, they need to find a path which is comfortable for them, and it will it will be the source of strength and comfort that we need every day, especially if we're alone. That makes a lot of sense. I know that for me, when I do my jogs or my walks, it is really a form of meditation. I actually prefer to be in my meditative space alone and think and contemplate or just listen and pray. And it just feels like physical engagement of being yeah. active, aggressive for me is actually a form of meditation because I'm doing a lot of sitting on my job. And I know for other people, meditation is a form of being very still. So yes. I have come to, to embrace the experience of body movement as a form yeah. of meditation. I know that Marianne Williams um, it, from the a miracle, uh, a course on miracles, it really does encourage meditating very, in a very still mode. But my mind is just happier when I'm in motion. So you yes. as a fitness trainer, yes. uh, how do you embrace motion and meditation? I would say that it's probably my main form of meditation. For all the years I ran, that was where I found my I could find that was my space and my place, and I could start feeling the calmness come in, inside me as I ran. So for me, running was actually my form of meditation, too. It wasn't until later that I started realizing I could do, I could be in the presence of, uh, be in the presence right now in a variety of ways. But for me, exercise was the way I did that. Um, and for everybody, the, that path is different. I would say that some of us probably want to be in a quiet space and be able to focus on, say, a candle to get into a place where we, we are connecting uh, to that higher source. Or we may just want to be doing what you and I like to do, and that's to be active and alone. Uh, I would say that there is no end as to the possibilities for this process to occur. It can take any form at any time. I find myself praying when I'm lying on the floor after my run and thanking God that I had a chance to do my workout today uh -huh. and thanking my legs and thanking my heart thanking my body for giving me another day to do what I love to do. And it's in that gratitude and that forgiveness that I find that we all end up becoming healthier. So every day 
in any form is a way is, is a way to say thank you and to be grateful for where you are. And I think gratitude expressed is really the only meditation that counts. Just be grateful for where you are, and whatever form that takes, it's probably the best thing you can do for yourself. Beautiful. So in other words, maintaining that that meditative presence throughout the day, regardless of what you're doing, almost as if absolutely. Gracious. You can even do it in the you can even do it in the car. You can do it while you're talking to your children. You can do yeah. it while you're working. You can find yourself being brought into the presence because you desire it. And as long as you desire it, it doesn't matter the activity. It doesn't matter where you are. I find myself sitting in a, a restaurant reading the newspaper, and I'll find that I want to say a prayer to myself of gratitude, and I'll just say it mentally to myself. And it comes at any moment, and I'll I'll embrace those moments as they come, and I'll be thankful for them. You know, the physiology behind uh, being a physically fit individual and also a meditator is really interesting. Some of the research has suggested that if you're meditating every morning, your immune system is enhanced. And they did a study of corporate workers where half of them meditated in the morning at the corporation facility and the other half did not. And the ones that did not meditate were much more subjected to sick days and flu, influenza, impact. And the other ones were much, much healthier. But in addition to that, they could measure by way of saliva and blood a serotonin and dopamine increase. Wow. Now when you add fitness to that and you have all these yes. wonderful chemicals that you're pumping, well, talk to us about that. It sounds like you're, you're right there. What are these chemicals that are so magical for happiness, for well-being, yes. for physical fitness, for metabolism? Go for it, Nick. I, I, I think that what I've learned over the years is that my body responds to my thoughts. And my thoughts set up the feelings that I have for the day. And every thought and every feeling is an activity which I consider to be a spiritual activity. So what happens is you set your body up to succeed by putting into your mind all of the things that you desire for the day. And what happens in this process is your body's physical nature actually shifts. The cells actually shift toward being happy. They have found in quantum physics that the cells of our bodies respond to our thoughts and respond to our feelings. If we're in anxiety and if we're stressed, our body responds to that particular stress by releasing cortisol. And cortisol is what they call the death hormone. It kills brain cells. It also manifests itself in the form of killing the ability of insulin to put to release blood sugar from the blood system and put it into the cells, which makes our systems become ineffective and can kill us, and it takes the form of diabetes. So there is actual physical manifestation of stress in our lives, and what I would like to tell people is be happy by, fo by forming thoughts in your mind every day that will bring you success, joy, and peace, and keep those thoughts manifest in front of you no matter what's happening in your life and keep the stress levels at bay because the stress levels that we are suffering right now will ultimately kill us. So cortisol is one of the main culprits and insulin is affected by the release of cortisol. So yes, absolutely. This whole process of meditation and, 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 and bringing the mind and body and spirit together is absolutely essential in our day and age. Uh, in order to live a happy and healthy life. So I, I begin every day with meditation and prayer. It's the only way to go. All right, exactly. Crawl out of bed, do a few yoga movements, and uh, move yourself into a state of mindfulness. Cortisol Correct. is also very interesting because since it is released under stress, it actually creates what you could call a carving into the brain so that the next time you think about that, that moment, the moment of trauma or the events of trauma, you actually are carving deeper into the brain that event, and it's That's being correct. carved by the way of cortisol. And so if you can move, if you can habituate yourself that in the moment the thoughts, memories, experience of stress hit you to move into the happiness, the gratification, correct. the exercise, the beauty around you, laughter, humor, yep. if you move immediately away from those traumatic thoughts, not to be avoidant, not to be repressed, again, that's my field, you That's are correct. not recarving into the brain a deeper groove into that the depressing, overwhelming experiences. And Absolutely. How, how, how do the hormones that we create when we're cardiovascularly pumping or just doing uh, weight training, muscle training, things like that, sort of, what are these hormones doing to our brain? What are they doing that are making us younger in the moment? 
the serotonin that's released is ultimately what we call the, uh, it gives us the runner's high. I think the reason that running became a part of my life back in 1964 when I started running at Syracuse was because I was, under mass, I was under massive stress. I came from Hawaii where I had been born and raised, and I was in Syracuse, New York, in the middle of my first winter, and I realized I needed to get out and run. And so the reason I started running at Syracuse was because the pressure of being in a new environment where there was no sunshine and having to deal with a brand new culture made me want to just get away and run. And what I found was after those runs occurred, I guess the serotonin in my, my little head started to make me realize I was safe and I was okay and I was going to have a happy experience. And so what running did for me, especially back in the early days when I got started, was I realized I was addicted to it. I became oh, addicted good. to running. And yeah, so the, the, the hormones for me addicted me to something that absolutely I needed. I, it was my drug of choice. Yeah. So for me, running absolutely became not only physically and emotionally and mentally, but spiritually something I had to do to find peace. And so I became a runner. And boy, did the running just set me up. I came back from one run. I'll never forget it. I was out in the middle of winter in four feet of snow running down the road. And my, my fraternity brothers thought I was absolutely nuts. And what I did was I came back I came I came back with a big smile on my face and I said, God, it's so quiet out here. It's so beautiful. And they all thought it was absolutely crazy. But it was the <laughs> best experience for me. It was the most exciting experience to run wow. in the snow when it was absolutely quiet outside and there was no one there because I was the only one running. And so I found moments like that absolutely became exhilaration for me. And I, I got addicted. I was literally addicted. So in the Air Force, I ran. After the Air Force, I ran. I kept running because I needed that high. And I just found that every time I ran, something good happened to me. And, boy, it yeah. just changed my life. It just changed the way I looked at my life. If you can't run, how do you create those exact same intense hormones in your body? What do you do? To replicate again, them. again, again I, I would say that you have to find something that eventually is a teacher for you. I think exercise is our teacher. And what I would say is you experiment. You have to experiment with exercise to find ones that bring joy into your life. It can be... It can be hiking. It can be walking on the shore. It can be looking at a sunset after walking up the, the top of a mountain. It can be uh, walking, it can be walking uh, uh, with a friend. It can be cycling. It can be swimming. But anything that moves you physically will move you mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So it, it doesn't have to be swimming. It doesn't have to be playing tennis. It doesn't have to be hard. It just has to be something where you're moving and you're engaging your body, your mind, and your spirit in that movement. So it can be dancing. There are people who are now really engaged in a lot of dance activities because dancing brings them joy. And I'm finding a lot of women out there want to just go out dancing because it just makes them happy. Well, dancing is a, a great activity, and people find they're addicted to that. Oh, yeah. So it, it doesn't, it, I think experimenting and just finding new venues, this is something I have to explore with myself since injuries are going to be a part of myself, of my activities now, because running is, it, it takes a toll. So I may have to do some exploration and find new things for me to do, too. It could be cycling. It could be going back to swimming. There could be a lot of things that can bring me joy beyond running. I just haven't bothered to find out. So, okay. again, I'm being... I'm being encouraged to find out those same things. I've got to find out if I couldn't run anymore, what would I do? I'd probably go back to being the little boy on Molly and start swimming again because that was something oh. I loved when I was small. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Okay, so, next, these, these people are going to want to get in touch with you. So you have to give us ways that you might do. How do we find oh, you? How do we find you on the net? Well, How do we read your book? How do we contact you? Well, I'm really happy to share that information. I'm on the net at www. Uh, healthyhappyfit.com. I've got the beginnings of a website there, and hopefully I can explore making that more interactive. www.healthyhappyfit.com. My email address is runningnick at sbcglobal.net. Runningnick at sbcglobal.net. And my uh, phone number here is 949-646-3015. And my cell phone is 949-244-9637. And I'm finding in this new age that we're living in that there are many ways to be found. And I'm happy that I'm exploring those possibilities with you and finding out that there is a lot of ways we can teach, share, and, 
and we can be with each other, and we may not even be in our physical presence with each other, but the fun part is there's a lot of ways to communicate. And so I'm looking forward to those new days. They're going to be ex- yeah, exciting, exciting and happy new days. Well, Nick, thanks for your generosity and providing us even with your cell phone, please. People don't misuse it. Just contact Nick to be able to help you train, <laughs> organize a fitness program that's going to match your age, your development. Remember, it's a progression. You're not going to stay in one spot. You're going to move on. Thank you so much, Nick. Good day, everybody. It's Carol Francis. Oh, I have... Thank you, Carol. I really appreciate it. Oh, that was fun. We're done. <laughs> We're done. Oh, that was Thank fun. Thank you, Carol. You're great. You have awesome, awesome energy. Okay, what I'm going to do then is um, as soon as I sign off, they're going to, because I have to hang up, um, they're going to start remedying the program, and then as soon as I get that, I'll get the URL and I'll send that to you. And, That's very sweet uh, of you, Carol. I really appreciate it. While we're waiting here, I'm, I'm on a chat room. Let's put your contact information. Um, again, what's your web page? www.healthyhappyfit.com. Okay. HappyFit.com. That's great. Okay, and then uh, contact Nick. I'm looking forward to meeting you too, Carol. Okay. <laughs> Carol, you've just been a voice. You've been a voice on the phone. I'm looking forward to meeting you too. You have a wonderful oh, experience great. base. You have you have a lot to offer. There's so much you're okay. doing that I'm. I'm very grateful for this opportunity, though. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you, Jay. Well, it's interesting that you're part of the spiritual, the spiritual community down there, Huntington Beach. You're the second person I've met that's doing the Church of Religious Science. I go to Agape up here at Carson City ever so often. It was neat to be able to find something that meant something to me. So I went to Peggy Bass's church, and that's how I started. And I just, I loved her so much. I just kept, I kept going. It was a really neat experience. Wow. <laughs> She's a wonderful lady. She was a wonderful lady and a great teacher, and I'm really happy that I ran into her. So it helped me a lot. Is she not teaching it helped anymore? Me. You know? She passed away. She passed away. Oh no, I didn't know that. Oh dear. Yeah. So Peggy, Peggy died a number of years ago, but she was a she was a terrific teacher, and I'm hopeful my life will have as much meaning as hers did. She was a terrific teacher. Oh wow! And then who's taking her place now? Well, they've had several ministers. There's a, a, a David something at the church right now. David something he's a really inspirational man but they're just continue to grow they're now the centers for spiritual living and uh, so I'm hopeful it, it it resonates with other people but again it's the spiritual path and everybody has to find their own path so like I don't know I don't know what's right for everybody I just know what's right for me yeah beautiful beautifully said well next week we'll talk <laughs> down the road I now have to get dressed and ready for work so this is great okay <laughs> Carol, thank, thank you so much. I really appreciate your – you did a thoughtful job. I really appreciate working with you, and I'm looking forward to seeing where all of this can go, and I love partnering with you. Oh, great. I do, too. Okay, well, we'll do this again, and then get this on your web page. Okay, ciao. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.